notice, or probably do not notice, because I didn't notice, that critics of the Bible, they do what they are good at. They criticize the Bible. And one of the things that they criticize about this passage is that the way the journey is described, the places that they're going and the order that they're going and do not make any sense because of the layout of the way the roads are today. But time and time again, archaeological discoveries show us that the writers of the Bible knew exactly what they were talking about. They found that the Roman roads, the way they were designed, ran exactly in the way that Matthew wrote that they did. And that's important for a few reasons. Number one, if the Bible contains any contradictions whatsoever, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant they are, and we were talking about this on Wednesday night, but if the Bible has even one contradiction in it, it would open us up to the ability to question everything in it. Because if they got even one little tiny thing wrong, what would stop them from getting the big important truths of Scripture just as wrong? And so this journey that Jesus and disciples seemed to take backwards was not backwards at all. So Jesus, he sends two of his disciples on a mission. He tells them, go into the village and you will find a donkey tied in a cult with her. So as I was studying this section, I ran into an interesting, it wasn't really a problem, but uh, we're going to chase a little bit of a rabbit for now. We're going to do it on purpose, and I'll tell you why when we're done. So if you're unfamiliar with sermon preparation, and it's really the same concept as teaching a Bible study, but one thing that you do is once you've got your passage of Scripture Uh, depending on the length of your book, you're going to read the entire book that it's found in, and you're going to do this several times because you're going to pick up on what are some of the themes that are repeated in in this book? What is the author trying to tell us? Um, What is the context happening in this book? And then once you've done that, you're going to read your specific passage over and over and over until you get a pretty good feel of what the author was trying to teach you. And then once that happens, once you've got a good grasp of what the text is saying and what it means, and maybe even what some of the applications from the text are, what I do, and this is not unique to me, we're going to look at a commentary. And we're going to do this for a number of reasons. One, I need to make sure that what I have found with the help of the Holy Spirit is not way off base from what our brothers and sisters also with the help of the Holy Spirit have learned. And so if we go and we, we sometimes will run into somebody that says, I have this new interpretation of this text that no one for 2,000 years has ever heard of. And if that's happened to you, let me just go ahead and tell you that you're wrong. Uh, there are no new interpretations under the sun. Everything has been learned. Everything has been taught. And so we have to be careful when we come up with a unique interpretation of the scriptures. Another thing the commentaries do is they can give us some level of confidence that the things that we're going to teach our people are true. If we look at 10 commentaries, none of them agree with you. You can pretty well have it on good authority that you are are understanding the text as it was written. But you do not want to be that person who disregards the 9 and goes with the 10 because it fits what you're trying to teach. And this is important for a number of reasons. Number one, we should question everything that someone is teaching us. We should weigh it against the scriptures. We should never just blindly believe someone, and that includes me. Everything I teach, everything I say, you should look it up, check me, double check me. And if I get something wrong, come tell me about it. I'm not going to be mad at you. But if you're wrong, I would love to tell you about it as well. (laughs) I'm humble, I know. Another thing that looking at commentaries does, and the emphasis is we need to be looking at multiple commentaries. We should be listening, if we're one of those people that like to look at online preachers, we should be listening to multiple preachers. Because if we stick to just one person, one commentary, we're going to just believe what they teach. Especially if this is a popular pastor, a popular author, we're just going to take what they say like it's the very words of God. And this is dangerous because they could be wrong. Even pastors that I deeply respect, sometimes I disagree with them. And that was the case this week. So as we, as we come back around, as we begin to, we're gaining on the rabbit that we're chasing here. But this is one of those cases where I thought I understood what the text said. I had a pretty good grasp of it. Of it. I knew how I was going to preach it. Except I get to looking at the commentary about this spot where he says, you're going to find a donkey immediately. And the, the commentary, I, I go to this commentary almost every week, but he said something to the affair of Jesus had arranged this beforehand. He had arranged that the donkeys would be there, except I didn't pick that up from the text at all. 
So there's no indication in the text that this was arranged beforehand. I said, well, how did Jesus know that the donkey was going to be there? It's because Jesus is God. And Jesus needed a donkey to be there, and so a donkey was there. And this is what's known as the sovereignty of God. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. This is all over the Bible, and it's especially heavy in the life of Joseph. I mean, Joseph in Genesis 50, and we haven't got there in Sunday school yet, so this is spoilers, but he says something to the effect of, he's talking to his brothers about selling him into slavery and the hard life that he had. He says, hey, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. God has his hand on everything that happens to you and I, both good and bad. And this is encouraging because it means that everything that happens, especially the bad things, did not happen on accident. They did not happen for no reason. Uh, The death of your spouse, the death of my mom seven or eight years ago, it wasn't pointless. It had a meaning. Because if God was not in control of everything, if God was not sovereign, then things ultimately would happen on accident, outside of God's control, And that would mean that things really do happen for no reason. It could really mean that you were born for no reason. We would be no different than the atheist who does not believe in God. Ultimately, we very well may have no reason for even coming to church this morning. But God is sovereign. And so we can be sure that we're here for a reason. Everything good and bad that happens to us happens for a reason. And so with God's sovereignty in mind, we can, I think, have it on good faith to disagree with this commentary and say, he didn't arrange it beforehand. He knew the donkey was going to be there because he needed a donkey to be there. And so, another thing that we have to note about our text is that Jesus tells them that they will immediately find a donkey tied. They do not need to go searching all over the village. They don't need to go knocking on every door, looking in every stable to find the donkey. Jesus said, you'll find it immediately. And they found it immediately. That's how powerful Jesus is. He could have said, go to the village, go ask around, you'll eventually find a donkey there. And they probably would have. But so such is the nature of miracles. Miracles are immediately And they do exactly what God meant for them to. So there's also something else that we have to note. There was a custom in those days that if a king had need of a beast of burden, he was able to relinquish one from anyone and for any reason. And those, the people that lived would have been familiar with this. And so Jesus, knowing full well that he was a king, he was well within his rights to relinquish a beast of burden. He asked not for a stallion, a beast of war. He asked instead for the humble donkey. And so when the disciples went to the owner of the donkey and they said, the Lord has need of it, he would have understood good and well what they were saying. The king needs this animal. And so they did not have to argue with the man. They did not have to twist the man's arm behind his back. He simply gave it up. So Matthew tells us that it had to be this way. Because hundreds of years before, as I've already said, as Colin read, Zechariah prophesied it. And every prophecy of God must come true. So Zechariah says that the king is coming, humble, not as a fierce conqueror to overthrow their oppressors, but humble. We understand this fully because we have the entire Bible. But they misunderstood the nature of the Messiah. They misunderstood the way that their king would be coming. And this might explain why they were so excited when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. And this brings us to our second point, a misunderstood king. (coughs) So we arrive at the point in our text when Jesus enters into the city riding on a donkey and he is met with a procession fitting of a king. The people were so overcome with joy and emotion that they cut branches from the trees and laid them on the ground along with their coats. Almost as if the king was too important for his beast to step on the dirt of the ground. These people, they were under, and we know full well, they were under Roman persecution, and they were not very happy about it. 
But the question was, were they excited that they thought Jesus was coming to liberate them? And that was certainly the case for some there, but we have no way of knowing if everyone there was excited just at the prospect of liberation or at the prospect of their Messiah finally coming. So the crowd shouts, Hosanna. This is a quotation from Psalm 118.25, a psalm about a king that comes to proclaim victory. They saw and they understood Jesus to be what he was, a king. But they misunderstood what type of king that Jesus would be. They say, Hosanna to the son of David, because that they hoped he would come in the name of David as a warrior king. But as we see at the end of verse 11, or in verse 11, they refer to Jesus as merely a prophet and not as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So we ask ourselves this morning, what is the nature of Jesus' kingship? And make no mistake, this entry into Jerusalem was in fact Jesus proclaiming himself as king. We see this clearly in the next section, and this is one of my favorite sections of Scripture. In the very next section of Matthew, Jesus goes into the temple. And what does he do in the temple? He chases out the money collectors out of his father's house. He goes to what we should understood to be his temple, his father's house. And he proclaims that he has authority here, and they needed to get out because they were making his father's house a mockery of it. So Jesus himself, he asserts his rightful authority over the temple. But we have to understand what this authority that Jesus has on earth is. We know that he has authority in heaven. We know that he has authority on earth. We know this from the Great Commission plan. Jesus himself said to Pilate, his kingdom was not of this world. And Jesus was no liar. There is no earthly palace that Jesus sits in here on earth. There is no set of lands that Jesus' kingdom occupies. Jesus' kingdom consists on earth of his people, of Christians, and should be understood to be a, a spiritual reign currently more than a physical one. Jesus is reigning spiritually, and as the gospel goes to the four corners of the earth, and more and more people hear of the saving power and the saving work that he did, the kingdom grows. The influence with which he wields his power and his kingdom grows. But Jesus did not come to wage war on his enemies. He came to save. Jesus came as a sheep to the slaughter. Why? Why did our Savior have to suffer the way that he did? Because had it not been for that first entry, a king going to his death on that cross, then there would be no hope for you or for I. And while the people misunderstood the first entry... They were not entirely wrong, because the next time that Jesus comes to the earth, he is going to be coming in the way that they wanted him to come the first time. We often see it depicted as Jesus descending on the clouds as this doting, smiling father with his arms spread wide open, ready to embrace you, but that is not how Jesus is going to come. He's going to come dressed for battle, riding on a steed for battle, and if you're one of his people... This will be the best thing you've ever seen in the world. But if you're not one of Jesus' people, it will be the worst day of your life. So our third point this morning is the final entry. And I usually don't do this, but we're going to move over a few pages to Matthew 24. So this is what is known as the Olivet Discourse, or this is simply a part of it, because that when he teaches this, he's teaching it from the Mount of Olives. And within these teachings, we learn something of Jesus' predicting the temple being destroyed, but what we're going to focus on this morning is that Jesus proclaims, or he tells us something of his second coming. So we, we look at Matthew 24, we'll read 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. First things first, this is not going to be a full teaching over this passage. I need a whole sermon or, or multiple sermons to really deal with this adequately. But mainly, I just want to make a few observations before we close. Here in Matthew 24, we learn that when Jesus does come the way that they wanted him to the first time, it's not going to be to overthrow the Romans, or not just to do that, because they've already been overthrown. He is coming to overthrow all of the enemies of God, including the sinful, cursed creation. Jesus is going to come back, riding on the clouds, and how on earth will every human see this at the same time? time. It's because the earth is flat. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I don't want to create a culture of flat earthers because I think it's crazy, but that was Colleen's joke, and she thought it was pretty great. So how will everyone be able to see this? It's not because the earth is flat. That's part of what makes it a big deal. We will be able to because Jesus is God, and if he can create everything from nothing... He can make it to where we can all see him coming back on the clouds. And then Jesus' angels will go to the elect. Don't worry about this word. Don't let this word scare you. We see it all throughout the Bible. For our sake, the elect are Christians. The angels bring them to Jesus' side. One of the big points of the passage that people often miss it's because they, people, like they do when they look at the book of Revelation, they try and look at every little sign and understand exactly what it means. But one of the points is that the return of Christ will be unmistakable. There will be no question about what is happening here. We've heard people try to say and try to, we see it on the news sometimes, that Jesus has already come back. We see people claim that they're Jesus in the, in the flesh. But one of the big points of this passage is that That will not be the case. There will be no need for us to get on Facebook and announce that, hey, I think I saw a man in the clouds and I'm pretty sure that it was Jesus. There will be, beyond a shadow of a doubt, everyone on earth will know that the Lord has come again. So the first time Jesus came, it was with arms wide open. He did not come to judge the world. He came to save it. He had no sword, but the second time he comes, I pray to God that all of us here are ready because those that are not in Christ, it will be the most terrifying moment of their lives. So as we move to wrap things up, allow me to remind you of the main idea. Jesus came the first time as a sheep to save, but when he comes to the second time, he comes as a mighty warrior to conquer all of his enemies. When Jesus comes again, it will be the most amazing time ever for those who love him. It will be the moment we have been patiently waiting for since he left this earth. There will be rejoicing and there will be weeping with joy. Our king has finally come to save us from ourselves and from the devil. No more will we have to put up with persecution from the world. No more will our brothers and sisters overseas have to fear for their lives when they profess him as king. When Jesus returns the second time, there will be no more divisions within his church. There will be a spirit of unity that has never before happened. But for those that Jesus does not recognize as his, it will be the exact opposite of that. It will be awful beyond imagination. Where there's unity for the Christian, there will be division for everybody else. Where there's weeping from joy for believers, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for the rest of the world. Friends, if you are sitting here this morning and you are a Christian, we should take great encouragement and comfort at the second coming of Christ. It will be the most amazing day we will ever witness. But if you are sitting here and you are lost, or perhaps just not sure where you stand, you should find great discomfort in passages such as these, because Jesus will not wait for you to be ready. When he's ready to come, he's coming. And when the appointed time comes and we hear that trumpet sound and we are seeing the king in the skies, you need to understand that 
He will not be the king you want him to be. He will be your worst nightmare. But thankfully, until that moment comes, he extends the invitation to join his kingdom. And you do not have to do anything difficult to do it. It's very, very simple to become a Christian. The only thing that you have to do is believe that Jesus is who he said he was and then confess that with your mouth. You don't have to have a perfect understanding of theology and doctrine. You don't even have to be a Baptist. It's controversial, I know. But here in a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If you need to get right with the Lord, if you just want someone to pray with me or some of the deacons or really anybody here would love to speak with you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus coming humbly the first time, proclaiming himself king to save us from our sins. Lord, and we just thank you as we look forward to the second coming of Christ when he comes to conquer every enemy and lastly, even death itself. Lord, I pray if there is anyone here who does not yet know you as their Savior, that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear your truth. I pray if there's anyone here who just needs to get back on the race, that you would convict them of that and that you would just help them along and that they would know that those of us here at Masham will help them along the way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please stand. things. You might notice we're missing two front pews. Uh, we did that for mainly so our disabled people have a place to comfortably sit and they have plenty of room so they don't have to be crowded in front of the pews. And we noticed that this was a really tight walkway. So if you were fond of those pews, we had a good reason for doing so. Secondly, we have dress rehearsal practice for the play pretty much right now. So don't run off if you're in the play. And then invite somebody to Easter. We would love to run out of seats. You are dismissed.